to what economists really do. Today, Professor Michael McMahon will talk about the UK macro policy and the cost of living crisis. So certainly very relevant topics right now. A few words on this talk. So there will be a recording on YouTube in a few days. And you'll also find past episodes of this series on YouTube. So my name is Alina Babic. I'm a PhD student at the economics department at the University of Oxford. And I'm very excited to introduce to you today, Professor Michael McMahon. He is a professor at the economics department here at the University of Oxford. He's also an associate head of the department here. He's a senior research fellow at St. Hugh's College and an associate member of Nuffield College, both here at Oxford. He's also the director of the CEPR's Research Policy Network on Central Bank Communication, and he's the deputy chair of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. So Michael's research is really what most people think economists are doing. He's working on monetary policy, he's working on inflation, but he's also working on fiscal policy. So think government spending and taxation. So he's really best suited to talk today about what's going on in the macroeconomy and the current cost of living crisis. A few words on the format. So Michael's gonna talk for 30 to 40 minutes and then there will be a Q and A session. So feel free to drop all your questions in the chat below and we'll get to them after the talk. So without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alina, and uh, uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, uh, before I get into the meat of this, let me make what I hope is taken as given, but uh, I am here speaking on my own behalf and not in any way necessarily representing the views of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council or anyone else. I will talk about research that I do, and uh, I will do so in my own uh, right, and may or may not, uh, even my co-authors may or may not agree with some things I say today. Okay, without further ado, let me go. So as, as Alina said, I, I, I do do what most people think economists do. Um, so this is a picture of me sitting in this same seat. Uh, I, I love this picture because it, it 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 has economic turmoil as if I caused it. Um, I, I promise it was not me. Um, but this is on the day that uh, the, the this was in the morning that uh, Quasi Quarteng, our then chancellor, was uh, flying back early from the G20 meetings in Washington D.C., uh, having just told journalists he would definitely still be chancellor next year. Uh, as it turned out, he wasn't 12 hours later, but uh, such such is uh, the speed with which uh, politics has happened in the UK recently. Um, so while I'm talking, I'm going to leave in the bottom this, uh, uh, those of you who know Menti, if you if you log on to www.menti.com and enter, it'll ask you to enter a code and the code is 78931892. There's a question there, which I actually ask my first year undergraduates uh, when I teach them at the start of the year, in Oxford, and it gives you a chance to list three themes that you think macroeconomics uh, should should deal with. Uh, I won't talk about it until the very end, um, but 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 I, I found the evolution of that over time to be quite interesting. But anyway, let me get straight into what I'm going to do. So, so it turns out I have uh, I, I I have appeared on TV many times, but uh, but but actually. Um, and, and most of the time you see economists on TV, they are talking about macroeconomics. Um, but but actually, mostly the people you see on TV are private sector economists. Sometimes you see policymakers, but not not typically do you see that many academic economists, some, but but not as many as, as the others. And so I wanted to sort of make clear some of the things that academic macroeconomists do and don't do, because I think it is a little bit different. So in, in general, we don't do forecasts. So uh, I saw something, I think, on Twitter advertising this talk saying I was going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. I can tell you uh, anybody who tells you they know exactly what's going to happen in the future is is is, is a particular kind of charlatan. Um, but equally, I, I don't certainly for the UK uh, spend a lot of time developing my own forecasts. So when I do talk about the outlook for the future, I will take other people's forecasts. What we do in general is we think about both theoretically and empirically how different things affect the economy, the macro economy. So I'm going to call those channels. And we also think a lot about policy, how policy can and can't affect those channels or policy is itself a, a thing that affects the economy. 
The other thing that we don't do is, and, and yet it, it doesn't sort of prevent people from asking, when you hear you're a macroeconomist, they ask you things about like stock prices or something like that. In general, I think we're just as rubbish as everybody else at, at forecasting those things too. So um, if those questions come in later, I will uh, swerve them pretty quickly. Okay, so where are we today in the UK? Well, you know, uh, at some level, the good, although there's a question mark after this for reasons I'll point out, Unemployment right now, as measured by the Office for National Statistics, is relatively low. It's below four. It's at four percent, around four percent. And you know, in, in general, low unemployment we think of as a good thing. And um, the reason for the question mark is that since the pandemic, there have also been changes in participation. So this is people have chosen not to be part of the labour market. So if if they were still in it, um, but were but were not in jobs, then actually. Uh, the unemployment rate would be somewhat higher. But even still, if you look in a historical context, we are currently uh, in, in a relatively good place in terms of the labour market. In terms of the bad, oops, jumping too ahead. In terms of the bad, uh, we, we look to UK GDP. So this is the level of UK GDP, and it's, it's plotted uh, here going back to before the financial crisis. I mean, there's some big things that stand out here. The financial crisis caused uh, a large drop over a number of quarters, but also a drop that was never really recovered from. So, so that's like a permanent shift. In fact, since the financial crisis, the UK has grown slower than we thought of as normal before the financial crisis. The other big and really stark part of this graph is, of course, what happened in COVID. I mean, COVID is a sort of un... Uh, an untried attempt of shutting down not just the UK, but many other world economies in, in a big way, very suddenly. But you can see that, at least in levels, we've gotten back to around the level we were at, say, in 2019, at the end of 2019. Now, of course, if COVID had not happened, we would expect to be even higher than this. So in some sense, that's still a weakness of, of where we are. And the fact that the most recent uh, evidence is that its GDP is now starting to fall, could be a uh, cause for concern. And then there's the ugly. Um, the ugly is the consumer price index. This is a measure of inflation, the rate of change of prices. And this is data that was released today and shows that the UK now has headline inflation rate that's over 10%, it's actually over 11% as of today. So this is the measure for last month. And you can see in a historical context, going back to even before um, before the UK had adopted an inflation target, which happened after they left the ERM, this is a high level of inflation. And this is sort of uh, one of the things I will obviously talk about today. I'm already seeing uh, some of the answers coming in from people on the Menti. And, you know, inflation is, is definitely one of the issues that people want to talk about. So I will talk about that. So here is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with inflation. And then I'm going to go on to monetary policy. I'm going to talk, talk about it a bit in general. And then I'm going to talk about fiscal policy. Um, I was given instructions that there should be no equations, but I'm going to violate that in two or three places because I think they're still instructive. Um, but then I'm going to hopefully get to, just by the end, to spend about five, five to ten minutes just covering recent UK macro policy. And hopefully the talk that precedes it will, will help put my views on that in context. OK, so let's start with, in, with inflation. So I'd shown you the, the sort of the inflation rates, which are the percentage change in the price compared to one year earlier. So when we find out today that inflation is running at 11 percent, this does not mean that compared to last month, prices are up 11 percent. It means compared to October in uh, 2021, prices are up over 10% on average. And you can see here then a plot of what the, 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 the index of the level looks like. And you can see that it's gradually trended up through the since the, since the start of the 90s and, and generally been in, in, uh, in line with, at least on average, the, the, the central bank's target or the government's target of, of low and stable inflation at around 2%. What you can really see towards the end is that change in the slope, that big pickup. If you can see the hand, it's this part here where this sort of rate of change just, just completely shoots up and prices have gone up higher. Now, 
Here's another way of looking at it. This is back to the inflation rate, but now splitting it between whether it's being driven by services prices or goods prices. And you can certainly see that the sort of low inflation, below 1% inflation around the COVID uh, period in 2020, the coming out of COVID has, led, has seen both an increase in services inflation more recently, but particularly goods inflation. And I will, I, I will have something to say on that. Um, but I also want to say, like we talk about the cost of living crisis, we also have to acknowledge a cost of inputs crisis. Businesses who are often accused of, you know, uh, taking advantage of uh, a, a sense of inflation to put prices up. This is officially measured both input in the slightly darker color and output producer price inflation. This means the prices that the producers face as inputs, so the, the, the costs of the materials they use to produce things, and the output is then what they're charging. And, you know, again, these are linked in a big network called the economy, but you can see that both of these are up, and actually they're both up now much higher in percentage growth terms than the consumer price inflation. So input prices for many firms have hit levels at or around 20% compared to a year earlier, and their output prices on average are going up by about 15%. Now, of course, when thinking about supply chain inflation, you end up in that horrible world, a little bit like when you're waiting for a plane or a train and they announce it's late, and the excuse they give is it's late due to the late arrival of the incoming uh, aircraft. I mean, that's essentially like saying we're late because we're late. Um, but, but that's also true with inflation. We get inflation because we have inflation. Firms that see all of their costs go up by 20% end up having to pass some of that on to consumers in the form of higher prices. But that's the world that we, we currently are in. This is the price level of that. And you can kind of see how flat since 2012 the, the, the price level of input prices and even output prices have been. But then the big increase, meaning that since, say, April 2020, when we were in the sort of first heavy lockdown, prices of inputs have grown by over 40 percent. So that's that's the challenge facing firms right now. One thing that's gotten a lot of uh, attention is, of course, the uh, gas and oil prices. So this shows, taken from the Bank of England's most recent uh, monetary policy report, this shows a measure of um, both spot prices, so the price you pay for immediate gas in pence per term, but also a futures curve, which tells you if you want to buy it into the future, how much you have to pay. Now, two things stand out about this. Since even... Um, the uh, middle of 2021, but then, of course, exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we have seen a big increase in the price of gas, but also an increase in the volatility. And although today the spot price has come down quite a bit, it remains higher than it was in 2020. And if you want to buy into the future, if you want to lock in prices, you still have to pay much higher prices or the gas companies have to pay much higher prices than they did previously. So although spot prices are coming down, this is so volatile, it's hard to read into it. And this sort of going forward, it's not obvious that prices have come down nearly enough to say that we're past the worst of the, the gas and energy crisis. The other thing that got a lot of attention was the cost of freight. So when we think about the cost of goods, a lot of goods are made in other countries and transported to the UK, and doing so requires paying for freight. So this, this picture shows that actually after COVID with the unlocking, but while there were still supply chain disruptions, say in Chinese ports, the cost of freight, particularly as people demanded more and more goods, the cost of freight went from numbers that were around $1,000, $1,500 up to $10,000 per unit. Now, they have come back a lot. So again, this is good news. But still, we're still looking at them being 30 to 40 percent at least above the levels we used to think were normal for freight prices. And again, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen to those as we go forward. So they're from from last week. OK, 
So now let me talk a little bit about how all that affects you as an individual. So the way we calculate uh, inflation is we produce an index, which is this P, and the P is a combination of, for all the, the, the consumption goods that you have, these are the sum over C, you weight how much you spend on, say, chocolate times the price of chocolate. And then you do the same for if you buy beer, the weight on beer times the price of beer. If you buy uh, electricity, gas, the weight you spend on that times the price of those things. And then once we have that, we have the overall index. And from that index, we can back out you know, what the inflation rate is. Now, what I've been showing you have been aggregated measures of this. So you would drop the I subscript for you. And what we would put in place is, what the average household in the UK spends on each good and the average price of that good in the UK. So when you think about what inflation you face, there are two big issues with this. One is that this, the share that you of your income that you or of your consumption that is spent on each good is likely to differ from the average. So I, I often make this point when speaking to my undergraduates, there's, there's almost certainly nobody who faces the average basket of consumer uh, uh, consumption allocation. So for example, this will include both nappies for newborns, nappies for you know, six month olds, nappies for one year olds, nappies for toddlers, as well as geriatric nappies, right? So, so a bit of all of them is bought on average in the UK, but I would guess very few houses buy all of them in those same quantities. And so if you really want to know how inflation is affecting you, in theory, you have to know how much you spend on each of these different goods. And then also whether or not you buy things at the average price or, you know, in some cases you might buy the more expensive pasta. And in some cases you might buy the cheaper pasta. And all of these can differ for you. So try to think a little bit about this. A long time ago in 2014, I, I contributed to uh, designing a, a, an inflation calculator that tried to estimate for different people based on their characteristics, because very few people know how much they spend on each good. Um, estimate based on the characteristics, how different people like you are to the average person. And so we updated that work recently. This was work with uh, uh, one of my former RAs who's now doing her PhD at LSE, uh, Dahlia Macaluso. And, and we basically came up with a way of trying to estimate for different characteristics how much they spend. So here, here's an example. There's, there's a category of the CPI goods called other breads and cereals. And the green shows you what in the household budget survey is the, is the uh, distribution of shares. So lots of people spend nothing on this in, their, in the period during which they fill in their diary of what they buy. But then there's some people who spend up to 30, uh, sorry, up to 3% of their, of their consumption is on this good. So, but you can still see, even if you sort of take averages across groups, which this distribution in purple represents, the average is about half a percent in, in, in there. But you could be someone who's closer to spending zero, or you could be someone closer to spending one and a half percent. And if these goods are going up a lot, that makes a difference. This is the, this is the total amount spent on food um, and non-alcoholic beverages. You can see there are some people who spend less than 10 percent of their consumption is on food. And yet there are some households in the survey who actually spent over 40% on this. Now, when food prices are going up a lot, if you only spend 10% on it versus someone who spends 40%, the person spending 10% is affected less. So with that, we were able to create a kind of calculator that let you work out inflation for people like you. And I just want to show you one example from that. Uh, I'll skip electricity, which is which, which is another example. But this is... This is um, this is an 85-year-old Asian male who's widowed or separated, lives alone in Wales, and has a weekly income of 300 of, of, of around 350 pounds per week. He has no cars, no, and is uh, has tertiary education, no kids, and no other adults in his household. Now you can see, for someone with those characteristics, on average, this person will spend more on Code Four. Code Four is energy, gas, utilities. And because they spend more, this estimate shows, and this is updated till the summer, that that person would face inflation that's about four, per, uh, four, four percentage points higher. So rather than facing 11% inflation, this person is now likely facing something closer to 15. 
if I gave an example of someone who spent less, they might actually only be facing eight or seven percent inflation. So again, but also this issue of, pr of prices, this is for milk. You know, I always think of milk as a relatively homogenous product. Um, and this is whole milk, you know, but but actually the price is faced across time and across different uh, stores and different geographical areas do differ. And there are, in fact, you know, so the median, let's say, is has been relatively flat for long periods and now has gone up about 15 percent. But there are also products in the whole milk category that are on average about 10 percent more expensive. The mean product is 10 percent more expensive than the median. This is because there's an upper tail of sort of more organic milks and other types of whole milk that they charge a lot more for or particular outlets which charge a lot more for the milk, maybe for a convenience yield. I'll skip that. So all of that tells you that we're facing very high inflation by historical standards. So I'm going to give you a first insight. I'll hopefully show this at the end if I have time. But looking at everybody's responses so far on the Menti, um, actually inflation is the most reported concern. There are other things that correlate to it, cost of living, standard of living. So if I go back and do this properly, it'll be interesting to see exactly how much is, is there on inflation. But to, to give you some context on this, when I used to do this over the years with my students, last year was the first time in about 12 years of doing this with first year undergraduates, either in Oxford or at Warwick, where I was before, where inflation was even mentioned. So we really have lived in a, in a life uh, over the last 15 to 20 years where most people have not worried about inflation day to day. And now it's there and we're all seeing the costs of it. So let me shift quickly to policy, to, to think about uh, policy for a bit. You know, so a big part of my research is about central banks communication. And if I was, a, if I was around 180 to 100 years ago, it would have been a really terrible research topic. So, so this is a quote from a former governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman, where his view to explaining things was never apologize, never explain. But we have, we have, you know, and, and, and central banks have changed. They now release lots of reports, the inflation report, MPC minutes. Uh, the Federal Open Market Committee is the US equivalent of the MPC. And this chart shows, you know, the reports that they release, how easy to read they are based on a very simple metric of essentially a reading age level. It's called Flesh, Flesh Kincaid. Now, actually, this is this comes from some work I have with Andy Haldane, making the case for communicating more easily and clearly with the general public. But you can see that in general, central bankers speak a language in their reports and uh, in their write-ups that is much higher than even The Economist magazine and certainly way higher than the level that political uh, actors like to uh, use. So who speak at like a much more uh, inclusive grade eight level. One thing that Andy pointed out before and, and, and we, we picked up on in our research, and I apologize for the colors in this chart. I, I've never put them together on the same page. And when I do, I realize the chart, the colors don't match, which is dreadful. But um, you can see that there's a big distribution of people who on, on the left hand side know what the central bank does or is trying to do. And that reflects also in a distribution of how satisfied people are with the central bank. You can see that around the financial crisis, you know, satisfaction with and in fact, other measures of trust in the central bank declined and they started to come back. But there is this still this distribution where it turns out people who don't know that much about it, what they do also tend to be it tends to be correlated with being less satisfied with the job they're doing. Um, but there is a sort of interesting difference as well that, that central banks have to contend with. This comes from work by um, Yuri Goridnichenko and co-authors. Um, which shows that uh, if you ask professional forecasters their views about what's going to happen to output growth or GDP or the, the amount produced in the economy and inflation, you can see across a broad range of countries, professional forecasters tend to think that these things are positively related. So when there's more production, we will get higher inflation. If you ask households, they tend to have exactly the opposite view across these countries. So they tend to associate bad economic conditions with expected inflation. So, so there's a communication challenge that already comes out with talking to this broader audience. So what is the bank trying to do? Well, the government has set the Bank of England a 2% inflation target. That's their, that's their target. That's what they're trying to get. Now, clearly, I've already told you that it's currently running at 11%. 
uh, which means they have missed, you know, I've sort of cut off the full slice of their website there, but they say if they miss the target by more than 1%, they write a letter. Uh, well, they've had to write a number of letters in the last while, justifying what they're going to do to try and get inflation back. Now, I want to talk about something that's really important, and this is the bit where I'm going to uh, probably make no friends. Um, there's there's something really important uh, that, that macroeconomists think of in, in monetary policy, and that's what's called expectations, including especially of inflation. And there's this second equation that I introduce into this talk, which is called the Fisher equation. And this is a very simple e equation. What it tells you is that R, which is the real interest rate, which is the return that you are getting in, in purchasing power terms is equal to, at least in advance when you're thinking about making, a, say, an investment decision, the nominal return, the money return you're getting. So if you go to your bank and they say, if you put your money in this bank account, you're going to earn 2% as interest. You go, OK, well, if I put 100 in, I'll get 102 next year. But the real return has to adjust that for how much you think inflation is going to erode, erode the value of the pound. So, you know, if you come out next year with 102 pounds, but prices have gone up by 10 percent like they actually have in the last year, your, your real return is actually negative. You, you, you can buy less with your 102 pounds now than you could with 100 a year earlier. This real interest rate is what macroeconomists think really matters. Now, Central banks work very hard to try and get everybody to what's called anchor their inflation expectations around the target. If we all believe that inflation will be 2%, then whenever they change the nominal rate, the, the, the say the central bank rate, they're changing real interest rates. And similarly, when if, if banks, and this is an important part that I'm going to talk about, if banks believe that inflation will be 2%, then they will be willing to pass on those changes in the base rate onto the the rates that matter to you as a, as a household or you as a firm, which would be the mortgage rate or the firm lending rate. So that the, the, the underlying part is as long as inflation expectations are anchored. Let me just show you this chart. This is what's happened to UK interest rates since the Bank of England had independence. The blue line is the official rate. And the other two lines are two vari variants of the mortgage rate. So the gray line, which goes back further, is a five-year 75% loan to value rate, because we know that depending on how much equity you have, you pay different rates. And the, the, the orange is a two-year 60% loan to value rate. What you can see is that in general, these things would move in lockstep. Expectations sometimes mean that they're closer or further apart. But what you can see most recently, we've obviously had a period of very low official rates and mortgage rates have come down. So mortgage rates, 2018, 19, 20, were somewhere around in the range one to two. Maybe if you're a first time buyer with less equity, you'd be looking at two to three. Since last year, and even before the invasion of, of Ukraine, banks have, start, have been charging higher rates. Now the Bank of England did start to put up interest rates. Um, at the start of uh, during this year, and they have gone up from a low of a let's just call it zero to slightly over two where they are now. But we can see that the increase in mortgage rates has been far higher than that. It's been up now going from numbers like around one percent for these type of mortgages up to six percent. So this growing wedge tells us that something else is going on. And I'm going to sort of paraphrase uh, Charles Goodhart here. Um, who, who said in his book about, you know, can central banks, people think central banks can control the amount of money in the economy, the monetary base. But if you work in a central bank, you know that view is totally mistaken. The same is true of perfect control of interest rates. Central banks can control their policy rate, but for the rates that matter to households and firms, that also depends on the decision of the, the lenders. And so when you think about a decision to lend, and I think this would apply if I asked any of you what, what you would expect. You know, the amount that you would charge for a, a loan over capital T period. So let's say it's a 10 year uh, loan. You could imagine a world where you want a return of about 1% per year. And then because this is nominal, you have to protect yourself against the, 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 the effect of inflation eroding the value of, of the, the nominal pounds you would get. So you might add, let's say, 2%. So now we're at 3% you want. And then there's a bunch of term premiums. 
Now, these are, these are things which could be because you think the person might default, but even if you think they're perfectly safe, you may be worried that although you expect inflation at 2%, you worry that it's going to be very volatile. Now, the problem comes if, if you lose your credibility as a central banker and you lose the nominal anchor, you lose the expected inflation fixed at 2%, then the mortgage rates that people face are going to go up because the, the bank lending money is going to want to protect itself against losing money through inflation. So that term might go up. But you also potentially, they become worried that inflation is going to be more volatile and that although they might think it's going to be three or 4% now, they also think it could be eight. And if they think it could be eight, they have to protect, they want to protect themselves against that. So losing credibility drives up these rates, even if the central bank doesn't move. And so this is, I think, one of the, the difficulties that central banks have faced right now. Um, so, so this is the bit where I definitely won't, won't make, uh, make friends. But, you know, people sometimes put the, 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 the policy challenge for central bankers right now as, you know, we can write, raise interest rates and cause pain to businesses and households, but, you know, convince the world we're tough on inflation. But if we can instead, we could also cut them and, you know, provide relief to households at a difficult time or businesses at a difficult time. That's not really true if you destroy your credibility. So if you destroy your credibility, people don't want to make loans at the rates that they, they used to think was appropriate based on your, your official rate. They will start adding extra on to the rate anyway. So the rates that households face and firms face go up anyway. Moreover, if the exchange rate depreciates, as we've seen in the UK, the price of imported goods goes up, adds more inflation, and also, as I'm about to argue, creates even greater pain later. So, you know, these are completely made up numbers, but here, here's a hypothetical. You know, you might think by not raising rates, you're helping, but actually you're not because now firms, rather than, you know, taking your 1% base rate, they now add expected inflation that's much higher and a higher uh, risk premium of on inflation. And next year, because because by not raising you haven't helped get control of inflation, inflation's even higher. That pushes the the gray bar, the expected inflation part, up even more, and the premium goes up even more. So we face six percent now anyway, and we're going to face eight percent next year. An alternative, if you rebuild your credibility, is you keep this gray bar at 2% and you keep the, the premium low. Again, I've made them up just for, to make it stark on the chart here. But you drive up real rates now. And yes, rates go up and they may even go up by more today. But it means that next year they can actually come down. That's the problem with losing credibility. So, of course, this is a real communication challenge. Um, uh, and, and so... Uh, you know, there's this famous quote by William Martin Chesney Jr., the longest serving head of the Federal Open, uh, the Federal Reserve in the U.S., who's described the central bank as the chaperone who's ordered the punch bowl removed just when the party was really warming up. So that already put, portrays central bankers as kind of pretty mean. But actually, this is quite a nice story. This is like we're all getting going at a party. The economy's starting to boom and you take away some of the stimulus. But that's not the world we're in now. We're in a world of people struggling through cost of living crisis, business struggling through cost of input crisis, and adding higher interest rates on top of that is really not nice. So here's my version of it. You know, now, now central banks are taking away the water and the paracetamol when everyone has a hangover. And it's not just that they have a hangover because they had a big party yesterday. It doesn't feel like 2020 and 2021 were big wild parties. You know, we didn't really seem to overindulge. It just feels like, you know, we've woken up and, you know, we've had this hangover because of our drink was spiked. So then the question is, what can you do? Well, again, why am I telling this story? I've done this story because some central banks, particularly those with less credibility, moved faster. This is sort of the Central Bank of Colombia. They started raising last October and have gone from two, let's say, to around 9% now. So they've moved very aggressively because they didn't want to lose the, the, the credibility that they had. Other central banks, Bank of England, ECB, Fed, are in general much more credible and therefore were able to hold off before they started raising rates. But once it looked like their credibility was in question, they've had to start raising more aggressively. 
and that's sort of important. I'm trying to make the case for why that's important. So I have work exactly on this with Anna Cislak, Stephen Hansen and Song Zhao, where we show that central bankers actually, even where they have credibility, fight very hard to fight it. I'll just show you a quote. Here's a quote from Janet Yellen, who's now the Treasury Secretary, but was on the uh, Fed Open Market Committee. And she talks in the policy deliberation that she believes that credibility is intact, but nonetheless, and this was from 2005, credibility going forward does depend on continued vigilance. And therefore, she basically supported removing policy accommodation. And whatever about rates being higher now than they were, certainly in real terms, policy is still quite accommodative today. And that's one of the challenges facing monetary policy. OK, I've overshot on time. I always talk too much about monetary policy. Let me spend uh, uh, just a couple of seconds. You, you get saved the equations on fiscal credibility. Um, but let me just show you one, one uh, key thing. I'm going to skip to this. OK, so I'm going to show you this one equation, which is this one at the bottom which some of you will have heard of. This, this describes, what it's called a fundamental debt dynamic equation. It basically tells you that the debt to GDP ratio, that's lowercase b at a point in time, depends on the debt to GDP ratio in the last period, say last year, plus the primary deficit. This is the deficit excluding interest payments. And then if you if you have any like bank bailouts or other one-off uh, uh, contingent liabilities that you have to realize, you have to add them in too. But the key thing is this difference between R, the real interest rate on your debt, and G. Essentially, what this is telling you is one of the natural dynamics for our for debt to GDP is growth. If you grow faster, because we measure it relative to the size of the economy, a faster growing economy means the debt to GDP ratio falls. If the interest rate is higher, it naturally grows up. And the balance of those two will tell you your dynamics. If, if they're exactly the same, debt should stay the same if you run a primary debt, uh, primary balance. Of course, if you run a, a deficit, you add to your debt. And if you run a surplus, you run down your debt. But this is really you know, important. You can look at things like if, they're, if, if phi, this term where R equals G, if they're the same, and you run a 60%, you start with 60% debt to GDP ratio, if you want to stay at 60% debt to GDP ratio, you have to run a primary balance. Now, what it also tells you is if your growth is high, so fee goes down, you can actually have situations where you can run a deficit and not actually add to your debt to GDP ratio. Of course, the flip is also true. If your interest rate on your debt is high and your growth is low, you actually have to run surpluses to keep debt at that level. Now, I don't want to say what the right level of debt is. You know, that's a political decision and something for politicians to debate, to determine through their manifestos and convince the public of. But what I do want to stress about all these kind of numbers is where you have to be a macroeconomist. And this word endogeneity, determined within the system, is really important. In the sort of accountancy I was doing before, you can think, OK, well, if interest rates are low and growth is high, happy days. We can we can run a, a, a deficit and still have debt to GDP fall. But these things change together. So I'll give an example from Ireland. Before the financial crisis, Ireland was had very low, relatively low interest rates, very high growth and, and was able to have its debt to GDP ratio come down to around 20 percent. But very quickly, as the uh, financial crisis took hold, interest rates shot up, growth shot down, and deficit spending went up a lot. That combination meant having looked like we had very favorable dynamics, very quickly they changed. Why am I mentioning this? Because it's also important that you have fiscal credibility, because fiscal credibility will help keep interest rates low. OK, let me, uh, Alina, I'm going to abuse... Uh, abuse my position and just talk for five minutes just talking about mostly with headlines on what went on recently and i'll bring in all of these concepts so to those who don't know i'm going to think about um it's still very odd calling it his majesty's treasury I, i've sort of over 20 years just got used to calling it her majesty's treasury and i may i may uh do that again i apologize i'm not fully adjusted um but i'm going to think about like there's some key policy institutions in the uk the bank of england which of 
sets monetary policy, also in charge of macro prudential policy. The debt management office, which is in charge of issuing government debt and timing those issuances to, to get the best low interest rates. There's the treasury and other government departments, which are responsible through the ministers um, for decisions on spending and taxation. And the office of budget responsibility, which essentially provides the forecast that goes into a budget, but also uh, provides costings about the impact of different policies. OK, so let's talk about the recent situation. OK, so here's here's even this is from August 31st. This is a CNBC uh, headline. Boris Johnson's likely successor wants to review the Bank of England's mandate, and some are worried. This was when Liz Truss spoke about removing independence or changing the mandate of the bank in, away from inflation to instead think about growth or something like that. Now, why were some worried? Because one of the things we know about monetary policy is that the effects of monetary policy are essentially entirely in the long run on inflation. So if you run a very loose monetary policy, you're going to generate high inflation. If you run tighter, you can get inflation back under control, at least over the long run. But the price effects are what dominate. The, the effects on the real economy, like jobs and real growth, are in most of our models zero. There's some new models that may have them slightly positive. But let's be clear that the big effect is on inflation. So if you take that away, it's essentially saying the government is not going to want the Bank of England to care about inflation. Think back to what I said about lenders thinking about how much they should expect for inflation and why that would worry them. And that might contribute to higher interest rates, even with no action. So then, of course, Liz Truss becomes prime minister. Then, of course, after Queen Elizabeth passed away, there was a sort of brief period uh, during which even the Bank of England put its meeting on hold. And then on the 22nd of September, the Bank of England, uh, this was the Thursday, they made the announcement of raising interest rates by 50 basis points. Now, this chart shows you um, how many interest rate increases? Sorry, that X is in the wrong place. The X should be lower. It was two. So markets were expecting three interest rate increase, three 25 basis point increases. So that would be 75 basis points. Now, a reason they expected that was the Fed and the ECB were both moving by 75 basis points around that time. You can see as the sort of time went on, as they built, when this settled at only two, what actually just happened was they now expected more increases by December. They basically were saying, we think the bank is, is behind the curve. Now, whether it was a lot or a bit, but th they expected more from the bank. And that came over the coming days. The next day was the mini budget. Now, why is the mini important here? Well, the mini is important because that adjective meant that the Office for Budget Responsibility didn't have to provide a forecast, didn't have to do the projections, didn't have to basically provide credibility. What does that mean? Well, again, you have now a government that people thought was trying to get the Bank of England to not care about inflation and is also now looking like it doesn't care about fiscal credibility because it's going to sort of circumvent the institutions designed to provide that credibility. Well, we all sort of know what happens. Here's an FT headline. Um, broke the bond market. Uh, you know, essentially, Lenders no longer wish to lend so much in the UK. This caused pricing problems for pension funds. I won't go into the liability driven investments, but essentially we started a kind of vicious cycle of sales. Which eventually the next week caused the Bank of England have to having to intervene to, to try and calm the markets. Now. In that period, we also had policymakers suddenly changing their views. You know, we get it. We have listened. This is the thing which I got most upset by in this period, because I don't think they did ever get it. And the sense in which they didn't get it was they were right that the UK needed growth. That part was right. Where they were wrong was they did not put together a carefully laid out, credible plan that had been checked by the independent institutions who are meant to check it to, to, to make that case for growth. By, by by sort of saying, we get it, we've listened, and then you know backtracking on elements. And they did this a number of times on different parts. It To me, at least, it just signals that you, you, you haven't got a plan. If I tell you I have a genius idea that's gonna you know, create you know, wonderful things, and then as soon as someone says, I don't like that part, I go, okay, well, that doesn't matter. It really doesn't seem like I've thought deeply and, and, and carefully about that. It seemed like the credibility was just being shot even more. Well, then we know 
the 14th, uh, two major events on the 14th of October. Uh, me on Sky News, obviously, was a major one for myself. Uh, but Quasi Quarteng being sacked was another. And then a few days later, obviously, we, we lost uh, another prime minister. Um, but you can just see here in numbers, this is taken from uh, uh, the Cunliffe letter, the deputy governor of the Bank of England's letter explaining what happened with their interventions. You can see what happened over this period. This is the MPC decision. These are 30 year gilts went up by uh, about 20 basis points. But now after the, the mini budget, which they called the fiscal event, they went up a further about 140 uh, basis points. That's huge moves. OK, now the interventions helped. They brought them back down, but it still meant the UK government compared to the 1st of September by the end of September was paying about 75 um, basis points more to borrow for 30 years. We also saw what happened, the exchange rate, both versus the euro, but even more versus the US dollar over that period. OK, so let me wrap up with going forward. Well, we have a budget coming up and it looks like we're going to get big tax rises and spending cuts. The Bank of England's projection are that GDP will fall and likely fall into recession next year as these measures take hold, although whether how much of the budget they have baked in uh, remains to be seen because the budget, of course, hasn't happened by the time they've done this. That will lead to uh, an increase in unemployment from the low rates around 4% that I talked about earlier up to levels around 5, 6, 7%, according to the bank's best guess. And inflation is expected to come back down but only coming back down to target over the next two years. So, you know, and that's, of course, inflation coming back down. Prices will remain elevated. But let me stop there and then take the questions. I've, I've bombarded you with a number of things and there's more details I'm sure you want. Thanks a lot, Michael. That was truly very interesting. Let me remind everyone to use the Q&A chat to ask all the questions you might have. I'll... Uh, ask you the first question, which in a few words, what do you think are the main challenges for the next few months for policy to work effectively? Okay, so um, I mean, I, I, this is why I realize this is not a popular thing to say, but, but for reasons of credibility, I think central banks have had to raise rates and I think they still need probably more to do a bit. Now, the, the advantage of that in my view is it will give them um, they will retain their credibility, which will and, and hopefully reduce the effect of the exchange rate on inflation, which will then allow them to be in a better position to potentially bring rates back down once inflation is shown to come down. Now, most people think inflation will come down, but we've seen from what's happened market rates that it, you know, they're not building that in as a definite anymore. So in that world, I think you have to show them you are committed to getting it back down, and then and then and then you know, un undo your increases sometime next year. I don't think a uh, reversal of interest rate hikes, for, if you if you hike this year and then you you reverse some of them next year, I don't think that's a sign of bad policy. I think that's a sign of recognizing the challenge on credibility. Now, that's of course not nice or, or easy. And so the answer to me is fiscal policy. The, the increase in inflation is a classic case where is what we would call a terms of trade shock. We are all worse off. Policy can't make that go away easily, right? So we have to decide what it can do is we can decide who pays the costs. Um, at the moment, you know, the, 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 the sensible thing in my view would be to have fiscal policy that directs resources to the most vulnerable in society. Um, so that is, you know, and there's always policy, to, fiscal policy is a political choice, must remain a political choice. But that was the advice we gave to the Irish government before their budget, which was the Tuesday after the mini budget. And it was quite well received, both by the politicians. They put it in place. Of course, some people disagreed with, you know, exactly the amounts or who, who benefited or who didn't. But in general, it was targeted to the most vulnerable. And, and in, in general, it was well received. And, and I think that's the best we can do at the moment. But, but that's not to I don't want to sugarcoat this. These are tough times. And, and as a country, we are poorer here in the UK. Thank you. So there is a question by Christopher, who's concerned that the official measure of CPI is depressed. And he's asking if you agree with that and if that measure might be understated. So his view is that there are hedonist, hedon, hedonic adjustments in the CPI measure. Uh, th there are hedonic adjustments in the CPI measure, but I actually think they're a good thing. 
I think if anything, um, the official measure, well, as I said, the official measure isn't a measure of any one person's uh, inflation. It's, it's a particular construct. But in general, what it does is it, it overstates inflation. Because again, maybe I'm the person who always bought uh, the premium pasta, but now because all the other costs are going up, I'm buying the, the, the lower price pasta. Where I think the where I think the problems really arise, um, and again, it's not a question of the measurement, but it's 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 a question of the challenges facing different households. You know, if I'm if I'm a middle income household, middle class household, and I am buying the sort of the 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 premium pasta, but because all the costs are going up, I can shift to the more basic ranges or the budget ranges. So so that's what's called a substitution effect, and that substitution tends to mean we move from higher prices to lower prices, because that's tending to be what we do. That's the sense in which this can overstate the, the inflation, because it says we're spending more on things that have higher prices than we actually do, because when their prices go up, we shift away. If you're, if you're the person in that distribution of prices that started buying the cheapest goods, there's nowhere for you to go. So for those people, I do think uh, that there is a problem with this with, with with this, well, not with the measure, just a, a bigger challenge because you have nowhere to substitute towards. In terms of hedonic prices, let me just say one thing on those. These are adjustments for the, the quality. You know, the price of a laptop, you know, a mid-range entry PC laptop has been about the same, give or take, for the last 20 years. You know, if you go to a shop now, you basically can spend somewhere like 700, 800 pounds on a decent laptop. Of course, what you're getting is many orders of magnitude now better than I bought when I, you know, when I was a student. So in that sense, adjusting for the sort of quality improvements is actually important and, and something which I think we should do just to, to touch on that part of the question. Thank you. So there's a question by Christian who is asking, how should the chancellor be thinking about spending cuts and tax rises? Should they be contingent on future economic outcomes or baked into policy at this point? Well, OK, so, so some of those uh, equations that I spared you from are actually from a 2017 piece that I wrote um, on, on this issue, which is, you know, th this idea that austerity is necessary, which was the argument that we had in 2010, 11, 12, uh, it is, is, is essentially, I think, uh, a nonsense. Um, you know, that statement is conditional on what you think is happening. So so to Krishna's question, it, you know, if, if you think the economy is uh, slowing, then if you have if you have spending that you think will boost the growth rate, that would be a good thing. Now, what credibly boosts the growth rate is a different question. And certainly the, the, the measures we saw in the mini budget were not the right thing. But, you know, the the, the decision to be made now is you know, and, and this is the bit that sometimes frustrates me about fiscal policy, you know, an adult discussion uh, at the with at the ballot box about what size of government spending we want in which areas and how we're going to pay for that. Because I don't think it's fair to say we can just shift it all on to future generations. Interest rate costs are going up for the government and that just takes away future resources if if. You know, but again, that's a choice we could make as a society. We can just say, you know, future generations can, can deal with this burden of tax. We can spread it now. We did that with COVID. COVID was entirely funded by debt. But again, when you have a sort of once in a hundred year event, it makes sense to pay for it over a hundred years. With with other things, we I think we do have to have a more open conversation. But this is a political decision. This is this is, you know, for them to decide. As I said, I think right now, if you if you're only concerned about the effects of the cost of living crisis, then you should you know be thinking about making more resources available to those most vulnerable in society, and allow those who probably have some some extra savings. Post COVID, we know some households sort of accumulated savings. They should be the ones that 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 um, that pay that pay for this a bit more. But again, this is a political decision. It's not a pure mechanical economic one. So Jennifer is asking, do you think the transmission mechanism from the base rate to inflation has been weakened or is perhaps even non-existent? I, I don't think it's non-existent, but but uh, that's, yeah, so I didn't want to put it in exactly those technical terms, but that's exactly the argument. It, as your credibility varies, 
um, and as expectations vary, but also as other things like competition in the mortgage market evolve, it's, it's never a fixed pass through and a fixed effect. But if you lose credibility, you break that link. And of course, the problem with breaking that link is in the future, even if you try to cut rates when we need lower rates, if you've broken the link, you don't have the effect that you might want to have. So, so I, I do worry that that's what's happening. Of course, all of this is super uncertain, right? You know, we, we, you know, the markets might change their view tomorrow and decide they're perfectly happy to lend because they do believe inflation will come down. Right now, that doesn't look like the numbers. They got very worried around the period of the mini budget and the lack of sort of, uh, sort of credibility. I, I was at an event recently with lots of central bank governors from other countries. And I have to say, I won't name the countries, but you know, the amount of uh, palpable schadenfreude from emerging markets who essentially said that, you know, saw that the UK suffered a credibility crisis, which is something you would normally associate with those places, um, what was, was, was a bit depressing to me. But anyway. Okay, so there is a bunch of questions still, but it, for the sake of time, I'll pick the last one. Um, so Emek is asking if it's possible for the UK economy to really recover without addressing the shrinking GDP as a result of Brexit. Ah, I, I, I had managed to get through the entire talk without mentioning the B word. Um, you know, I, well, I, I, I you'll guess from, uh, I mean, I've been 20 plus years in this country, but um, I, I am a, I am a, an enthusiastic European. So uh, I personally think that economically, I think the evidence is very clear that, that Brexit has been costly. That's not to say that we don't ever make decisions that are costly for the level of GDP. I'm sure we have plenty of regulations that protect against some things, but also mean we grow less quickly or have less GDP. The question is whether it was worth it. Um, now, whether the government has to address it or not, it, they have to face the new reality. The new reality is that um, that trade seems to have been weakened, growth is certainly weakened, and and the question, and this is why I do say Liz Trust was kind of right in this, you know, the UK would be better off with more growth if it's the right kind of growth. But I think we, to me, the big disappointment, even if I ignore, you know, a, a, it's a democratic decision, Brexit, so that's fine. Um, you know, we've just come through a decade when government interest rates were at, at or around zero for 10, 20 years, there's a huge number of long-term challenges that the UK and other advanced economies face, addressing climate costs, addressing an aging population and, and you know, the health and, and pension costs that come with that. How can we address those? Well, some of them could have been addressed by investing in productive capacity, particularly on things like green energy, you know, imagine the world would be in now if we had four or five times the capacity of renewable energy creation here. So, you know, that period of, of essentially free money for the government has passed and we missed the chance to do it. So that's kind of the disappointment. Um, just while I know you're going to stop me now, but I'm just going to show you this is what the responses came in at. And you can kind of see that, uh, mo you know, th there was a big focus on cost of living and inflation which again, just highlights the challenge because in a world of weakening economic situation, but together with high inflation, that's like the worst combination for policies to have to deal with. But that's the world we find ourselves in. And I hope that macro policy can credibly tie to deal with it. Thanks a lot, Michael. That was very fascinating. There were a lot of questions and I'm sure we could have talked for a long time. So um, if you're interested, follow us on social media. There will be an announcement on our spring sessions on what economists really do shortly. So thanks for joining today. And thanks again, Michael. And goodbye for now. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alina.